we went and bought computers that had never been connected to the internet. All the phones were taken out of the room. Um, and in my own office, I unplugged everything, including televisions, um, fridges. At one point, the cabinet secretary pointed out through my window to a block of flats across the water, next door to a canal. And he said, you realize the Chinese will be in there and they'll have, I had a glass of water in front of me. He said, they'll have a, a, a laser on that tumbler and they'll have turned it into a microphone. They can listen to what we're saying now. It, it, it gave you um, pause for thought. So, you know, the curtains came down immediately. And then when I got home, I did the same. I unplugged everything. Hey there, it's Kelly, and welcome to a rather different episode of Curveball. I'm in London at the moment, so today I'm going to introduce you to a leader that I've admired for a few decades. He was previously the editor of The Guardian newspaper in the UK. He also set up The Guardian in Australia and the US and was previously the principal at Lady Margaret Hall College in Oxford. Alan Rusbridger was at the helm of The Guardian newspaper in some really interesting times. The rise of social media, the advent of the internet, huge stories like Edward Snowden and, of course, Julian Assange, who is still in a prison in London, possibly to be extradited to the US shortly. But on the day that I turned up in Alan's office, which is just down the road from Westminster Abbey and around the corner from Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament in London, and and on this day that I turned up, it had just been announced that the most famous Australian media baron ever, Rupert Murdoch, was to step down from his chairman role of News Corp and Fox News. So lots of interesting things to discuss shortly on Curveball. It was an unusually warm and dry July in London in 2013, and the editor of The Guardian newspaper was buying an angle grinder, a rather curious tool for a newspaper editor to need. But this was not a usual time in the history of the newspaper. Editor Alan Rusbridger had sent two of his staff into the basement of the paper's headquarters. Two officials from GCHQ, the UK's intelligence and security agency, looked on. The newspaper staff started pulverising hardware containing many of the key pieces of information about claims by whistleblower Edward Snowden about the NSA in the US. Alan, this all seems rather quaint now looking back, but why did those intelligence officials insist that you destroy those documents in the first place? It's always been a slight mystery to me um, because we had a conversation, a very gentlemanly conversation beforehand with the secretary to the cabinet, David Cameron's cabinet secretary. And I told him that we had the documents in uh, New York and that we would, uh, if he tried to stop us publishing in London, we would publish out of New York. Uh, I mean, the pretense was that they wanted to make sure that there was no leakiness or lack of security around the material we were holding. Uh, I understand that, but they made no attempt to um, come to New York and, and check that we were holding it securely there. So it felt to me a bit like a piece of theatre, to be honest. Can you take me into that basement that day? How exactly did those rather dramatic events unfold? Well, we, we had bought the uh, equipment. Um, I think they bought other bits of equipment that you can't get from the local DIY <laughs> retailer. Uh, and w we were clear that we wanted to do it. Uh, there was something optical about the state coming into a, a, a news organisation and destroying material. We felt more comfortable doing it ourselves. Uh, and so they stood over my colleagues uh, pointing at various bits of a, of a, you know, an Apple Mac or whatever the machine was. Um, and it, it's obviously harder to destroy a computer than you might think. You know, you can't just bash it with a hammer or shove glue in the, uh, in the, in the drives. Uh, so there, there were particular bits of chip and motherboard that had to be 
um, comprehensively ground to dust. Did you ever consider refusing their request to hand over the information? Well, I did ask what would happen if if we didn't uh, comply with this, and uh, it, it was clear to me that one of two things would happen. We would either have the police come around and confiscate the stuff and, and physically shut down uh, the thing that we were reporting on, or they would get an injunction. I, th- I think it would probably be in that, the latter. So they would have got, got an injunction, they would have said, you cannot publish anything. Uh, the Washington Post was also in possession of the material, um, and it felt to me, why, why argue and have a sort of multi-million pound legal battle during which we wouldn't be able to publish anything? If we could simply go to New York and publish it from there, but that did that did involve having us to uh, to destroy the machines. So let's go back a step in your editorship. When was the first time you had any contact with Edward Snowden, and how did that come about? We had hired um, we, we we had started a, uh, an, an American edition, uh, and. I had decided that we would concentrate on security as one of the things that we wanted to report on and hired a man called Glenn Greenwald, who lived in uh, Brazil, oddly enough, um, but was um, a, a prodigious blogger about security matters. So we hired him. He, he brought with him an audience of about a million. He had a very huge uh, devoted following. And it turned out that one of those readers was a man called Edward Snowden, who then got in touch with him. He he had something to, <laughs> something to get off his chest, um, something quite big, um, and he he trusted Glenn Greenwald. Um, and after some uh, missed bits of communication, because it was all a bit cloak and dagger at that point, uh, the two um, got together, and the rest, as they say, is history. When reporters are working on highly contentious national security style stories, you know, dangerous secret information that has monumental consequences, how much do those reporters share with you as the editor? Are you well across all of that at the time? Well, there were two phases to the to the story. One was um, Glenn and uh, and Snowden in a hotel room in Hong Kong. I felt uneasy about that because I'd never met Glenn Greenwald. Um, and although he was clearly a very um, popular blogger, I thought I needed somebody from the Guardian staff in the room. And so sent a reporter called Ewan McCaskill to, to, to as it were, be, be in the room with him and Snowden and Laura Poitras, who was a filmmaker. Um, so I, I needed that kind of reassurance so that we had a sort of direct editorial line back to me about anything that they were discovering. The second phase was once they had left um, Hong Kong and, and Snowden eventually ended up, ended up in Moscow, as we know, but it, what he had given us was many hundreds of thousands of documents. Um, now, again, as editor, I couldn't be across all those, but I was very, very closely in touch with a team of about six to eight people who were plowing their way through those documents. Um, and then every time we felt we were nearing uh, publishing, I was then one of the link people with whoever it was, the NSA, uh, GCHQ, MI6, uh, whoever the document referred to. I understand that at the time there were different moments when Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald, the, the two journalists working on the story, who you know are essentially independent journalists in many ways, sort of impatient with the more traditional publishing methods, wanted to go elsewhere with the story. Did you ever worry that you were going to lose it? It was one of the complications. So, um, I mean, when I look back on it now, the, the, the time frame was immensely compressed. So Snowden was in the hotel room. I think he thought he had hours, perhaps rather than days, before they noticed that he'd gone missing and they tracked him down. So I think there was always the fear of the knock on the door and just losing everything. So he was in a hurry to get some stories out because that was his best defence. And uh, I suppose our instincts were to slow things down. You know, we, we... 
there's a there's a wonderful bit of film where where Ewan's just arrived in Hong Kong. He's got his notebook out, and um, and and Snowden is talking very excitedly about stuff, and Ewan says. Can I just stop you there? He said in his Scottish accent, which I won't attempt to. Um, he said, um, but who are you? <laughs> he said, I remember it's known as S-N-O-W-D-E-N. So like Ewan was, let's not take this to, you know, I need to find, know who you claim to be. I need to know who you actually are. I need evidence. I need proof. I need to know that these documents. So all those, those are the checks that we wanted to go through against Snowden and Glenn, who, uh, you know, let's just get... We, if, you, if you're not going to publish, because you're probably too chicken, because you're mainstream media, um, I, we don't need you any longer. We can publish on my website. And can you take me inside your thought processes as the editor at that moment? Because, I mean, ultimately, high... I can't think of many more high-stake sort of stories, but your editorship perhaps is on the line if you get this wrong. Uh, how much were you worried about the calls that you were making? Uh, it was easily the most complicated and fraught story I, I was involved in in 20 years as an editor. I mean, it wasn't just my editorship, it was my freedom. Um, uh, I mean, you know, we were dealing with official secrecy laws in the US and the UK, um, and it was pretty clear we were near the edge, if not over the edge, of those. There was the question of damage, uh, unintentional damage, um, that you could cause by publishing the wrong kind of information. I, I use it in inverted commas. There was the, the security of the documents. That, so there were ethically, legally, morally, technically... It was complex on every every possible level, complicated by the fact that we were working across three different time zones. Um, Janine Gibson in, in New York was editing a lot of this. Uh, for a while, the, the key players were, there, were in Hong Kong. I was in London. Uh, we knew that um, the Washington Post also had the material, could publish at any time, so that was a time pressure. Uh, and we knew that once the... Uh, authorities, that's the American and British authorities mainly, once they got to know about this, they would be around knocking on the door and trying to put pressure on us not to publish. So it was it, it was like a sort of game of five-dimensional chess. Do you think you were more, um, more concerned about the US government, the British government, Snowden, your wife? I mean, the number of people to juggle in this mix what what was the biggest fear at that moment well you do get um heightened paranoia in such circumstances and we had been told that we had to create a room inside the guardian when we, when the material came back from hong kong that had no electrical equipment in it so we went and bought computers that had never been connected to the internet printers that had never been connected to the internet um all the phones were taken out of the room um, and in my own office, I unplugged everything, including televisions, um, fridges. <laughs> um, at one point, the cabinet secretary pointed out through my window to a block of flats ac across the water, the, I was next door to a canal, and he said, you realise the Chinese will be in there and they'll have... I had a glass of water in front of me. He said, they'll have a, a, a laser on that tumbler and they'll have turned it into a microphone they could listen to what we're saying now whether that was true or not uh it it, it gave you um pause for thought so you know the curtains came down immediately and then when i got home i did the same i unplugged everything and and um if i wanted to talk to my wife we went out into the woods and and did all the things that spies are supposed to do incredible the story finally breaks in June 2013. What was the initial reaction both here and in the US? Well, I had flown to um, New York by the time we published our first story. And um, I will always remember pressing the button uh, to publish. And then there was a, a wait uh, of about um, half an hour before the screens all exploded. Um, 
it was a Sunday afternoon, so the, the, the networks weren't really geared up for breaking news. And then from that point, for about the next three weeks, it was the only story in town. Um, and m morning, noon and night, the American networks um, were all on this all the time. I understand that just after breaking the story, you had a visit from the Cabinet Secretary at the time, Sir Jeremy Haywood. You know, what kind of pressure was he putting on you at the time? Well, he he, he came in and said, um, you know, we've obviously been reading it. He, I mean, I, by the way, I was quite surprised it took about 10 days before they came around. I, I thought they would be rather quicker. But anyway, he said, look, um, something like you've had your fun and now's the time to stop. And I think I was probably rather pompous in saying, actually, I don't think it's for the British government to tell a newspaper when enough is enough. You know, that, that's that's my understanding of press freedom is that <laughs> that's for me to decide, not you. Um, so he, he went away. It was all very civil. He sent some security people around to try and touch up the security around the material we were holding. And then about a week later, the, the, the tone suddenly changed. And um, they, that was he and the um, press secretary at the time, became much more aggressive in, in demanding really that we close down all our reporting. Which is interesting to me, and I'm wondering about the role of media and patriotism, I guess. In Australia, there's been claims by politicians sometimes when the ABC or even the newspapers do some reporting and there's this subtle, maybe not so subtle line that comes out from the politicians around like, whose side are you actually on here when you're uncovering top secret information? And we will get to Julian Assange shortly, but was there that sense of, you know, you shouldn't be doing this simply as an act of patriotism? It is difficult, and um, I, I think, you know, if we were honest, because eventually we ended up collaborating with the New York Times, and I think there were moments where we would look at stories and we would be publishing something about their NSA, which they, I could see them getting a bit sort of um, uh, anxious and protective about, and sometimes they were publishing stories about our GCHQ, and in each case, we both felt much more comfortable writing about the other's security lot than sometimes uh, about our own. Um, I think that's natural, and I, I think there is a there is a tension there between your job as a reporter and your feelings as a citizen. Uh, you, you, I don't know if you remember, but I was eventually hauled up in front of the House of Commons Home Affairs Select Committee, and the uh, I was quite startled by a question from the chair who said, we, it happened, we were, we'd both been born outside the uh, the UK. He said, you were born, you and I were both born outside the UK. I love this country. Do you love this country? Um, and eventually my answer was, well, I do love this country and we're, we're all patriots. Uh, but what we love about this country is that we can publish this story. You know, we have free speech in the, in the UK and... Um, that seems to be something really worth cherishing. I think Edward Snowden said at the time he was trying to demonstrate that we're really on the road to total surveillance. And that's in 2013 and already so much has happened since then. Do you think he was right? I think he was right. And I, I think everything that's happened since um, has confirmed the, 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 the fears he had. I mean, I, the, the, there's no doubt, I, I think, that the, the situation he was describing um, was as he described it. Um, and, you know, subsequently there have been a lot of court cases and challenges over the legality of, of what various agencies were doing. Uh, and quite a lot of them have been successful. Um, and I've met spooks since who say, you, you know, we were sailing close to the wind, you know, or we had... Uh, it very rapidly developed from a world of copper wires to uh, the, the the ability to to keep virtually everybody on the planet under surveillance, and um, we hadn't hung around waiting to get complete um, 
sanction for all of that. We just, we got away with it, to be honest. Um, but the, the second half of that was also quite interesting, that actually when the British state, I think the Australian state, and to some extent the American state, the governments all then um, rushed to pass laws to make sure that what they were doing was put on a legal footing. Uh, and by and large, they got what they wanted. So Snowden's point, which I think was a valid one, was really about the fact that th this was all being done without anybody's consent. Uh, and since then, that's been remedied. I don't know if you can answer this question truthfully or not today, but do you have any contact with Edward Snowden these days? Um, I, I've been to see him three times in Moscow. I haven't been in contact with him for two or three years. Will he ever be able to leave Moscow? My instinct is that um, it probably not. Um, I mean, I, I think the passage of time may may help him. Um, you know, maybe in 20 or 30 years, um, there will be a democratic president. It's probably going to be a democratic president who, um, who would say, look, en enough is enough. Um, but I think the, 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 the sticking bit, the sticking point for Snowden is that he would come back and stand trial if he was allowed to mount a defence. But under the, um, the Espionage Act, there is no defence. So it's, it's, it's a slam dunk certainty that he would go to jail for, for a long time. Uh, and from his point of view, why would he do that? You know, he's, got, he's now got kids, his, his wife is there. Um, why, why would he sacrifice all that for the certainty of going to jail? He ultimately, though, has made an incredible sacrifice. He can never live in his home country again. His, his freedom is ultimately curtailed in one way or another for the rest of his living, the rest of his life. Do, does he have regret about what he's done? Is he happy that he's done it? Has he reconciled it some a decade on? He, he says not. Um, so, as I say, I haven't seen him for two or three years, but when I last saw him, uh, he was at peace with what he had done and thought it was something that he had to do and had, he had no regrets. Uh, you know, whether, whether in the middle of the night, um, when he thinks about the rest of his life in, in Russia, uh, I mean, I, I think it would only be human to, to feel, uh, to have mixed emotions about it. But I, I think intellectually, he thinks he did the right thing. The editor-in-chief role of, of any leading newspaper, especially a global one, is, is tough. And I've read that you felt quite frightened by the sense of power and the role of the editorship of The Guardian. What was it that frightened you in particular? Well, you go from being uh, quite a private person. Um, you know, no, nobody knows who the, the deputy editor of any paper is um, because your job is just to uh, you know, commission the pieces and, and get them to shame, get them out of the door. Um, and then suddenly you become public property. Um, and what happens on your watch is your responsibility uh, legally and ethically, um, financially, technologically. Um, and all, all kinds of things can go wrong and do go wrong. You know, I mean, you know, at the most basic level, there are, there are people who are in danger, um, uh, you know, being arrested or being kidnapped or being you know, covering wars and, and, you know, that's your responsibility. But also you have this extraordinary power, which still makes me nervous. Um, you are, you are the, in a sense, the judge and the jury. It, certainly in, in British newspapers and I think Australian newspapers, you, you have one editor who is across news and across comment. So as an editor, you are you're suddenly the person who is writing these editorials saying, you know, X must go or X must stay or X must resign or this must happen and that must happen. And though the, the power of those editorials may be waning a bit in the age we now live in, uh, it's still um, quite, a, quite a chunk of power to suddenly give somebody who's never had that before. Um, so I, I did feel a bit overwhelmed by it, and I don't, I'm not sure I managed it for a long time, 20 years, and I'm not sure I ever really quite got used to that power. And you became the editor of The Guardian in 1995, which was 
you know, really only a few years after the invention of the World Wide Web, I don't think even Google was on the scene at the time. What was your experience of the internet and why did you drive this transformation or sort of push into the digital age? In 1995, when I took over, there was, I think, one computer in the building that was uh, connected to the outside world. Um, <laughs> we, had, we, we, we were doing photo composition and we could communicate with each other, but the thought of using these machines to talk to somebody outside the building was a strange one. I had flown to America in 1994 to see the New York Times and the, uh, a paper in San Francisco and um, what a, a newspaper chain was looking at in um, uh, Boulder, Colorado, of all places. Um, and the moment I saw what they what they were capable of doing, even though, of course, it was tremendously um, slow and primitive, I thought there's no question that this is going to um, destroy the, the physical uh, newspaper. I don't know if it's going to take five years, 10 years, 30 years, but we have to... So we have to move. And so when I became editor in 1995, I knew that my editorship would be defined by how successfully we transitioned. I mean, I don't, I hope this is not too bold, but you know, you're, you're an Oxbridge, you know, an Oxbridge graduate. You're, you're not a sneaker wearing Silicon Valley tech dude. Um, you know, there would have been other editors at the time who wouldn't have necessarily made that link. In fact, there were many other editors around the world who actively resisted that. But was it that clear to you that that was the way it was going? It was. Uh, I remember uh, we also went to Chicago and on the Chicago Tribune, they had a very primitive Apple Mac um, and they said, look, we can, do, we can do advertising of people's houses. We can show people's houses. I said, go on now, well, show, show me what you mean. And um, they had a very primitive video of inside a house. And I remember it almost loading line by line. So having told me that they could do this, it took about 10 minutes before this, this um, jerky video. Uh, but I just looked at it and I thought, that, <laughs> that is it. Um, I didn't need any more convincing. I just thought um, the printed page is going to find it very difficult to compete. Um, but you're right, lots of people... I mean, we, we went to New York, and the New York Times at that point had decided that news was not going to work on the internet. They were just doing listings, and uh, it was like a sort of um, guide to life in New York. They, had, they thought you know, it was ridiculous to think that news would ever work. So there were these sort of chasmic moments where suddenly the ground opened under your feet you thought, oh my God, um, uh, this has happened. Well, that, I mean, when, after we had done Web.1, which was essentially to put the newspaper onto the web, but n not just that. So I, I think we went beyond others in thinking this is not simply taking a newspaper and bunging it up as a method of distribution. We can do different things. We can, we can go into more depth. We, we, can, we can be infinite in the depth of, you know, covering whatever subject we want to do. Um, and then we had to get used to the idea that people could answer back. You know, this was a two-way process. But, but around about 2006, we thought, well, we've cracked that and we're pretty good at that now. And then somebody walked into my office and said, there's this thing called World, World Wide Web 2, uh, the social, what it's now become known as social media. And that was the ability of everyone to talk to each other. They didn't need us any longer to go via us. Uh, and I said, is that big? And they said, yes, this is, this is going to be bigger than the first web. And I thought, oh, my God, we've got to start all over again. And then 2007, somebody came into my room with an, uh, with an iPhone. The, do you remember it was launched on the iPhone? And, uh, a tiny little, it seemed ridiculous. You thought, well, that's a lovely gadget, but no one is ever going to read a newspaper on an iPhone. That would be ridiculous. Uh, and that was hideously wrong. And then the same year they started Facebook. And I told everybody in the office they had to be on Facebook so we could sort of experience it. And it was just people talking about what they had for breakfast or... Um, or, or how the bus was late this morning. 
And again, it seemed to have nothing to do with news. And then, oh my God, another cosmic moment. <laughs> so uh, it was just a series of, of tidal waves. You felt engulfed by everyone. And you either gave up or you fought it, and some people did find it, or you thought, shit, this is exciting. We can, you know, we, we are the generation that's going to reinvent journalism. And I, I tended to be in that camp. I'm Kelly Reardon, and my guest is Alan Rusbridger, editor of Prospect magazine and chair of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University. He was previously the editor of The Guardian, and shortly he'll take us inside the case of Julian Assange. This is Curveball and I'm Kelly Reardon. Alan Rusbridger is the editor of Prospect magazine. He's also the chair of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University. And he was previously the editor of The Guardian in the UK. Now, Alan, before Edward Snowden, there was, of course, an Aussie called Julian Assange who reached out to you with a scoop. What were your first impressions of Julian? Well, I first dealt with him without having met him when he was based in Kenya, um, and he he just emailed me with with, with um, a story about corruption in Kenya, and uh, it was a good story. Um, he had the documents, we used it, and we stayed in touch. Uh, I I sort of vaguely followed his progression, um, but it, it was when my colleague Nick Davis came into my office one day and said. There is this guy, you've written about him on page three, but you completely missed the story. He has got a, a backpack full of <laughs> secrets, um, uh, American defense secrets, and he's on the run. Should, should I go and find him and sort of bring him in? So um, he brought him in. Um, I met him a few times and uh, we worked together um, to begin, with, to begin with quite closely and then um, things became more complicated. Um, there were, of course, multiple uh, leads from WikiLeaks across the next couple of years, but everything changes, of course, in 2010 when WikiLeaks themselves publish a video of US air crew shooting down Iraqi civil, uh, civilians, I think a couple of Reuters journalists as well. What was going through your mind when you first saw that WikiLeaks had published that? I think they did it with the, the New Yorker. So, but, but nevertheless, they, th this was clearly a, a global story of, of, of huge significance. Um, and I think it was a moment where a lot, a lot of people in the news industry sort of sat up a bit like Bellingcat today, you know, this sort of, you know, operation that begins in a garage, as it were, or a bedroom, and then suddenly is, is sort of, you know, world-beating expert on intelligence and defense. So people at that point set up and thought, okay, this is interesting. Um, this is an operation that seems to be able to get at highly secret material that we ourselves would die for. Um, who, is, who is this person and how, how, how are they doing it? The, the relationship between The Guardian and Julian Assange wasn't smooth sailing, though. How, how did it look different to the Edward Snowden relationship? They're very different men. Um, Snowden is um, highly intellectual. He, he had come out of the, the, the belly of the intelligence world um, and so he wasn't a public figure in in any sense, didn't particularly want to be. He definitely didn't want to be a publisher. Um, he just handed over the material to journalists and said, that's it, this is my involvement, the story ends here. Do what you want. He's a source. He's a source, yeah. So Julian was everything. He was a, well, he, was, he wasn't the source. Chelsea Manning was the source. But, but he brought the story in. But he also wanted to be the publisher. He wanted to be the editor. He wanted to be the impresario that was the activist, the celebrity. The activist. He was. He was. He had fingers, and and every time you met him, he had a, a different guise. And uh, it's completely understandable why he did that. 
and partly it was a question of survival. Um, but he definitely wanted to be in on the selection of the stories and the presentation of the stories, um, which in, in a way helped him because it, it meant that he could call himself a journalist. Um, but it also, um, I, I think, m made the target on his back bigger. I was going to ask, you know, he has obviously been very unwell. He's been imprisoned for a long time, first in the Ecuadorian embassy in London and, and now in prison in London, and now under threat of extradition to the United States, which the UK has agreed to and Assange's team has appealed. And a rather large group of Australian MPs, a cross-party group, which is quite unusual, and I think there's about 60 of them have petitioned to have him released. Do you think he should be released now? Yes, I can't see any purpose that's now being served. Um, he, he's been in a form of confinement, some of it self-imposed, um, some of it in maximum security prisons. I, I, can't, I can't see what purpose is now being served by locking him up. There, there are people who have um, done much more serious crimes of violence who would have been released by now. And the, the, the main thing that really aggravates me is this question of extraterritoriality. Um, so uh, Julian is an Australian citizen working in London and he has, it's claimed, broken American rules around national security. Turn that around, imagine it was an American citizen um, working in, a journalist working in London who had written about India's nuclear program or Pakistan's nuclear program, i.e. Uh, broken domestic laws about secrecy. Can you imagine the, the Americans would ever voluntarily relinquish and hand over a journalist to India or Pakistan because they had broken domestic laws? It just would never happen. Although your own government, the UK government, has said yes to this extradition to the US. Yeah, I, I think it, it's entirely wrong and I can, again if, if you try and flip it and would it can you imagine any circumstances in which a journalist from the New York Times would be handed over to the Indian government because they had broken the Indian secrecy laws just it just wouldn't happen uh, and I think it speaks to the uh, I mean it's very interesting when you look at these documents the so-called five eyes um, uh, network of spies which includes Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US and UK. Uh, and I think they're all very chummy and they all work hand in glove. That's the whole point of the network. Um, uh, and I think the, there's one rule for the five eyes and one rule for the others. Are you still on Facebook's oversight board? I am. And what prompted you to join? Well, because I'm a utopian, you know, I was always the one who thought um, it's true. Our readers know more than we do. The, the, the advent of social media is a pain in the ass for, for journalists because it, it, it has the potential to uh, undermine, if not destroy, our business. Nevertheless, as a citizen, it's kind of miraculous. It's kind of miraculous that everybody on the planet, in theory, has the ability to be a a publisher. Uh, and the narrative suddenly turned and, and nobody was willing to say anything good about about social media. And of course, if you're, the, if you're a journalist and you've got the megaphone, you're going to um, pour the brown stuff all over it all the time. And I thought it was important to try and help the engineers, you know, because Zuckerberg's got brilliant engineers but they don't think about free speech or uh, or the nuances behind what kind of speech deserves to be protected. So I thought if this there is a way of collaborating with uh, you know other journalists, philosophers, lawyers, political scientists, human rights activists to to try and um, create a framework of speech for the internet. And that's a, a really important thing to, to do. We have Elon Musk now ruining Twitter, or X as it's now known, and we have the rise of Chinese-owned platforms like TikTok. What are the challenges for Facebook now, do you think? 
Um, it's, it's mainly a question of scale. Uh, if Facebook publishes to whatever it is, three, three billion people, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an unimaginably large audience. So the, the scale of content that is flowing across Facebook, Instagram, Messenger is vast, unimaginable. And how on earth can you devise the systems to weed out the misinformation, the hate speech, the whatever bad things people are doing in order to keep these platforms safe and and um, civilized spaces and I don't think anyone is claiming that any of these platforms is that yet and probably technologically we're not capable of doing it at that speed yet but I do think um, Facebook's creation of the oversight board showed a, 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 a serious uh, willingness and a bit of humility, actually, to, to, to say, look, we can't do this on our own, we, we need some help. Although I was reading through the judgments for many of the Oversight Board's decisions, and it seemed to me that you overturn more of Meta's decisions than you do uphold their decisions, like by a ratio of about five to one. So that to me indicates they're still not really properly committed to operating a little bit more like a, a publisher or having those terms of engagement. Um, you know, are they taking the sorts of responsibilities that they should be much like a publisher did 200 years ago? Well, all that's in flux and it's changing even as we speak with, um, you know, the, we just had a, a bill passed in the UK literally days ago. There's a, a European re legislation um, the, the Americans are wondering about whether this fable, Section 230, um, which really defined Facebook as a as a platform a, 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 rather than a publisher, so it, was, you know, it exempted them from liability for, for the material they were publishing. I don't think anyone thinks that can hold forever, and the European and British legislation is changing that rapidly and demanding some kind of appeal and oversight structure. So I think um, I think the reality is that they are a form of publisher, but it's not like publishers have ever been in any time of history because no publishers ever published hundreds of millions of pieces of content a day. So I think if you were, I think the people who really don't like social media and don't believe in it and don't want it to exist would like it, would like Facebook to have absolute liability for everything. So imagine what that would mean. You know, it, you couldn't you couldn't be Facebook and do that because you would have to have hundreds of thousands of lawyers and and contents and other you know the, the the whole thing. So it's I don't think it's useful to say you are a publisher and you must be liable for everything. So they're they're moving to a position where they're saying, well, okay, you have to prove that you can act responsibly responsibly and quickly when things are pointed out to you. Um, uh, and I think that sort of halfway house is probably where we're at at the moment. Media organisations did give over their audience to Facebook and Spotify to some degree and possibly then regretted it when they realised, you know, what that was about. You know, it, it was all about going to where audiences are and being on those third party platforms. But then media companies realised, well, the third party platforms then own that audience and all the data associated with it and then... Cambridge Analytica happens and we all realise what we give up every time we log on to one of these um, platforms, especially ones that track our every move. Did the media get it wrong, do you think, in in moving so much of its audience to these third party platforms? You know, if we get, should we be putting some of the genie back in the bottle, if not all? Uh, I, I think as Whoever is it, Churn Lai is supposed to have said of the French Revolution, it's too early to tell. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know. We don't know. Um, it, it seemed pretty obvious to many in the early 2000s that if the audience was somewhere else, then you wanted to be where the audience was. And it was like King Canute to say, no, no, you must come to us. Um, uh, now, some, some media organisations have succeeded. They're, they're mainly elite organisations, so the organisations that cater to uh, wealthy middle-class audiences. They 
Financial Times has done brilliantly. The New York Times is held up as the example of... So they have succeeded in saying, well, if you want us, you come to us. And by the way, you're going to have to pay and you can't read our content. Uh, in the UK, um, that's true of 9%. 9% of the population pay for any news and 90% don't. I remember talking about this with the editor of the New York Times, Dean Bacay, who said, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that it works. But, you know, I was born on the wrong side of the tracks in New Orleans and... And sometimes I worry about the 97% of Americans who don't read the New York Times because what are they getting? They're getting Fox News and they're getting talk radio. Um, and you get this, you, you see the effect, you know, that, that affects the kind of populist politics that you get with a very educated elite, reading educated elite media, walled off from the rest of the... So, you know, these are big societal questions as well as the pragmatic questions of what people are prepared to pay for. Um, so, you know, it's very easy to say in a British context where 9% of people have said they're willing to pay, you should all be putting up paywalls um, uh, and and coming off Facebook and, and ignoring Twitter. Um, but, you know, the biggest growth companies are companies like TikTok where, you know, the, the, the under 30s, um, want that kind of immediacy and speed and visual excitement. Um, and if you say, well, I'm sorry, but what we do is uh, in print on big, big pages. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, that's how we want to serve you. Um, you're, you're probably not going to last very long. Speaking of Fox News, I cannot believe I've joined you in your office in the centre of London on the very day that Australia's most recognised and well-known media baron has decided to step down. What are your first thoughts on Rupert Murdoch finally uh, retiring? I thought he wasn't Australian. Well, you know, <laughs> you we claim him. him when we want to yeah. and we don't when we don't. But uh, um, you know, suffice well, to I, say, the pharmacy of his newspaper career was in Australia. Yeah. Um, well, I've only seen, as we speak, it's it's um, four thirty in the afternoon and I've, I've just seen one, one uh, snap from the New York Times saying that he's stepped down and his son Lachlan is, is stepping up. I mean, he's... Um, He's an extraordinary character, and and it's difficult to imagine we will ever see anybody quite like him again. Um, there are pluses, uh, you know. I think he he genuinely loves journalists and journalism. He's been a defender of journalism. He's been an innovator. He's had huge commercial successes. He's been um, a great defender of uh, journalists. So I, I don't think you can say uh, it's a completely black and white picture. Um, there have been enormous ethical failings, um, phone hacking in the UK, the, the complete, disgraceful, appalling debacle with Fox News, knowingly punting out lies, which led to the insurrection in, on January the 6th in, in America. I think he coarsened the, the, the debate in Australia and, and uh, the UK, certainly. Uh, in, did a form of intrusive journalism that had never existed before. And the way he exercised power and monopoly uh, to get his own ends, whether they be uh, political or, or business ends, uh, was really unattractive. Um, and but you put all those together, and the, especially the monopoly and the power, and, and the fear that he was unable to um, to engender in in all ranks of people that if people displeased him they could end up at, at its boulders being destroyed um, you know why one would ever put that power into one person's hands again I don't know but um, but it, it's not a black and white story and I think people will be writing biographies of him and his family for many years to come. What are your thoughts on Lachlan as the successor? I don't think anybody can step into his shoes. Um, I, don't, I don't see any evidence. I mean, I haven't, I haven't followed 
the story of Lachlan immensely closely, but I, you know, he he was notionally in charge of Fox News at a time when these appalling ethical failures were happening. I mean, in any other company, <laughs> a chief executive who presided over a billion dollars worth of damages for knowingly, I mean, that was the point, knowingly, they knew that what they were broadcasting was, was lies. They'd be out. Uh, and yet, here's the heir assumptive, um, completely protected because his name is Murdoch. Um, so, I, you know, I've, I've got more respect for James Murdoch, who has walked away from it and, and I think just felt he couldn't stomach it any longer. Uh, um, but, you know, that's not the way the, the, the company works. Do you think, uh, you know, at the moment all we know is Rupert Murdoch um, stepping down, uh, you know, resigning from his position. You know, he's in his 90s. I think we can probably assume that he will shuffle off this mortal coil at some point. Do you think that Elizabeth or James would then try to reinsert themselves into the company once Rupert's gone? Or is it really very much that Lachlan is the heir apparent and and that will be? Listen, you know, there were 32 episodes of Succession, which was, <laughs> <laughs> which was a fairly... Um, <laughs> what will they write about now? Yeah, I mean, you watch Succession, you thought this is all completely plausible, you know, the, the kind of family dynamics that could play out. I, I, I should think it's not going to be succession, but it's going to be messy and uh, I would predict that the the company will be broken up, you know, um, but, I, but um, you know, who knows. You're also an amateur musician or perhaps a semi-professional one, Alan. So why did you take on the rather extraordinary task of tackling, I think, one of Chopin's most difficult and extraordinary pieces of music? Well, I, I suppose it was a midlife crisis. Um, that, that point Most in people buy a sports car, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> it was my version. Um, I think I think lots of people um, encounter a feeling um, of in, in midlife that, that there's more to life than simply working from nine to six, or in my case, nine to nine. Um, and I think lots of people. It's the, the big regret of a lot of people's lives that they gave up a musical instrument. Um, and I, 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 music had been a very important thing to me when I was young. I, I went on a, on a piano course and, and saw a person who I knew was no better than me playing this extraordinary, the first ballad of Chopin. And I thought, well, if he can play that, that must mean I can play it. <laughs> and I set out to play it and I ended up writing a book because it took me about 18 months. But it was also a weaving of... You know, why is amateur music making? What's the value of amateur music making? Which was co coincided with the debate that we were having in the office about what's the value of amateur journalism. Um, uh, and uh, those two stories coincided also with, with WikiLeaks. And, and music, music was quite an important safety valve. If, if I could play the piano for 20 minutes a day, it kind of it was an it, it was an important distraction from everything else that was going on. And and was it your way of managing your mental health and your stress levels during that particularly difficult time? I mean, I just can't even imagine how you're dealing with. Edward Snowden is in a room in Hong Kong, and I'm dealing with you know lawyers and politicians and spy agencies. But I'm just going to sit at the piano for twenty minutes. Uh, well, it was it was, and I mean there was there was one bit in the book where. We had a, an amazing correspondent in Libya who disappeared, and I realised there was about to, the war was about to break out in Libya, and I thought there's nothing for it. I'm going to have to go to Libya to get him out. Um, I was in touch with Gaddafi's son, so I jumped on a plane to, to Tripoli and and sat in a ho deserted hotel in in Tripoli, um, and there was a piano there, um, so I. I, for three or four hours a day, I went down to this ghostly deserted hotel and, and, and just played the piano. And there was a sense of, uh, of this was something that was so different from editing and just involved the motor skills of what, was, um, what, what you could persuade your fingers to do. It, it was very different from 
everything else going on in my life. What do you think it teaches you about resilience? You know, a, to tackle a, a, a piece like that that is so extraordinary and is beyond most amateurs to, to tackle it and is going to take you significant time to get on top of. Well, I, I became very interested in the, the mechanics of learning and how the brain works and, and, and how you memorise and, and, and how you sort of completely break down a piece into individual notes and you just work on that. So you, so, so you have to think about it intellectually and deconstruct the piece in order to work out what the problem is. I mean, for me, it was playing the piano. Some people want to get their golf handicap down or learn to sail or, or go to the gym. Um, I think it almost doesn't matter what you do. But I do think in these highly stress, stressful jobs, it's quite important to do, to wall off a bit of the day and just say, for this 20 minutes, this half an hour, I'm going to switch the phone off. You can't get in touch with me. And I'm going to do something that has got nothing to do with my job. I think that that does build resilience. You now have taken on another editorship role at Prospect Magazine. Why, you know, and you've come to that via the principal at Lady Margaret College in Oxford, but why come back to magazine editing again? Well, I've decided I like editing. so, you know, I, I, I like Don't journalists. No credit national security issues in this no, magazine, No, no, we, 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 we don't break stories at Prospect. Um, I like journalists. I like their company. I like sitting, I mean, you know, at, at what we do is we sit around and we think what's interesting, what's going to be interesting in three months' time, what, what's important, and then who could we get to write about it? Um, and when that comes off, you get a, an incredibly clever person who can write like a dream on something that matters. And you can then bundle that up and say something important. You know, it's really satisfying. And it's quite nice to step off. You're sort of half off the news treadmill. So what I think of as the quintessential two pieces we published earlier this year, one was about immigration. And we got the former permanent secretary at the Home Office to write about it. And he began his first paragraph was, forget the small boats. You know, it's really, this is not the story. You know, Brit- Britain can easily take 20, 30,000 people a year. The story is about the, the, the huge mass scale of you know, the inability to process the hundreds. Of, mass migration. Yeah, there's a vast refugees. story there which you have to face up to and, and think about deeply. And then we did something, I asked, Jonathan Powell, who'd been Blair's um, negotiator uh, during the Good Friday Agreement in, in Northern Ireland, and I said, how do you negotiate an end to Ukraine? And again, he began by saying, well, you know, what I write is not going to happen in the next six months or possibly the next year, but at some point there will be a negotiation. And when they sit down, this is what they're going to have to talk about. Uh, and those feel to me like really important pieces to run because um, no one else talking about them. You know, the, the, a lot of the media just gets caught up for under, understandable reasons in, in, you know, what's happening this hour, this minute, this day. And just to be able to stand back and say, actually, the, there's a bigger story here is tremendously satisfying. Well, congratulations on such a stellar career. It's been such an enjoyable hour to spend it's with you. It's been lovely talking to you. Alan Rusbridger, the former editor of The Guardian newspaper and now the editor of Prospect magazine in the UK and a member of Facebook's Oversight Board. Curveball's produced by Deadset Studios. Make sure you share the word. If you love the show, please introduce someone else to Curveball. We really appreciate your support on spreading the word about this show. You can also find Curveball in any podcast app. And you can download all the episodes from curveballshow.com. This episode was produced by Liam Reardon and the executive producers for Curveball are Rachel Fountain and me, 